Thank you very much. So the first thing I brought to you today is a picture of myself when I was six years old. And at that age, I would probably be at home right now and play with Legos, because I just love the creative process of taking apart an old design and creating something new. For example, taking apart the pirate boat just to build a spaceship. Now, later in school, I was interested in sciences, but I also cared about people. So I thought, well, maybe I should try to go into medicine. I didn't really know what that means, so the first thing I did was doing a nursing internship. And there I learned in the hospital that I actually like working with patients. However, I also realized that most of what doctors actually do is just trying to help the patient's own body get to a point where it can cure itself. And every time when we're unable to do that, for example, in patients with chronic diseases, then medicine has a big problem. So let me give you one example where our work frequently fails, and that is cancer. Cancer cells are generated by mistake, and they're sick, they're mutated, and they try to grow incontrollably. Usually, our immune system can recognize sick cells. For example, we have specialized immune cells called T cells that have T cell receptors, which may recognize a mutated protein that's present in a cancer cell. So this allows a the T cell to find the cancer, attack it, and eventually kill it. Sometimes cancer evolves too fast and acquires mechanisms to avoid T cells, or just grows so fast that the balance um, tips over in favor of the cancer and the immune system is unable to fight it efficiently. Now, over the last decades, our understanding of the role of the immune system in cancer biology has dramatically changed how we envision to treat cancer in the future. And it has been a truly creative process. For example, scientists took apart different immune receptors and fused them back together to form what they call a chimeric antigen receptor, or short CAR. When we introduce these CAR molecules into T cells, we can teach them to effectively recognize and kill certain kinds of cancer cells. And for the last four years, we now have commercial products that are based on this technology, which we can use to treat aggressive form of blood cancer like B-cell leukemia and B-cell lymphoma. So usually, when a patient has failed multiple times on standard chemotherapy, he may be selected to get this kind of therapy. And the first thing that we need to do is to draw his blood and select white blood cells, which are then sent to a manufacturing site where viruses are used to genetically equip these cells with CAR molecules. Then this CAR T cell product is sent back to the physician who can infuse it into the patients, and we have seen dramatic responses with this kind of therapy. However, there are also two big problems. First of all, this entire process takes about one month. And it sometimes even failed because the T cells are too hurt by the chemotherapy that the patient received before. The other important point is that these therapies are extremely expensive. For one successful treatment, we have to pay 320,000 euros for a single individual. Now, I brought you today a technology that could help us overcome these problems. In this small tube, I have mixed synthetic DNA, and CRISPR-Cas9 protein complexes. So what is CRISPR? CRISPR is basically a tiny molecular scissor that we can use to specifically cut a specific place in the DNA of, for example, T cells, and thereby introduce a change in the desired location. But let me give you some context for that. So I brought this book with me today. This is Infinite Jest by David Foster Wallace. It's a fascinating book, but it's also massive. It has over 1,000 pages and sums up to a total of over 3 million characters. In comparison to the genome that is present and stored in all of your cells in your body, this is still not a lot. We would need more than 1,000 books of this size to print all the information. And CRISPR-Cas9 is amazing because it allows us to navigate through these 1,000 books in just minutes, 
help us identify a single sentence and then change it for our purposes. So we and others have used CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing and synthetic DNA to replace T-cell receptors in T-cells with tumor-specific cars. And this reprograms the T-cells to specifically recognize the cancer and nothing else. And in theory, we can use this to create universal CAR T-cells, large amounts of it, but from healthy human donors ahead of time, then freeze down multiple dosages after a single process and have these treatments ready so when patients come in, we can treat them without treatment delay and theoretically also at a significantly reduced cost per dose. Now, this is just one example of many others how CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing could be used to improve our healthcare. However, let's go one step back. Obviously, CAR T cells, I cannot just make them in a garage somewhere and not even a regular research lab. If we want to use this in patients, what we need is something like this. A fancy laboratory where we basically have super clean air and highly trained manu um, manufacturing personnel, which then does a lot of paperwork in addition to make sure that these cell products are safe for use in real human patients. If we want to take this one step further and actually do a clinical trial to see whether such a therapy works, then we need even more people. In addition to the technicians and the researchers that we need to manufacture these cells, we also need regulatory experts, lawyers, experts in logistical issues, and of course, physicians and nurses who take care of the patients once we infuse them with these cells. And Europe is not doing well in this regard. We're not good at taking these great new ideas from basic research, making clinical applications, and then starting clinical trials. So to illustrate that, some of you have probably seen parts of the Olympic Games that happened earlier this year in Japan. And if you look at the final scoreboard, you will see that the dominating two nations are the United States of America and China. However, if you would count all uh, nations of the Uni European Union as one, Europe would actually lead the field by far. And this is really where I think our potential is. The picture is completely different when we look at the running cancer cell therapy trials that happen right now. Even if we would add all of European Union's clinical trials and add the ones from United Kingdom, we would still have less than half the amount of clinical trials than both of those other countries. And what does this mean? In sport, if you're behind, that means you run a few seconds slower on 400 meter track. In medicine, it means that we are unable to provide access for our patients to potentially life-saving treatments, and that for multiple years. And Personally, I think that is really sad. So if we want to treat chronic diseases like cancer better and more sustainably, we have to invest into these new technologies, but also in an infrastructure that allows us to bring them to the patient. And one potential solution how this could be done was formulated by the EU-funded research consortium Restore Health for Advanced Therapies. To catch up, it would be the most efficient thing to install large academic incubators strategically spread out in Europe where we fund these large teams that we need, where we fund the expensive infrastructure, and where we create a framework where we can collaborate efficiently with startups, biotech, and pharmaceutical industry. Unfortunately, the roadmap that they formulated was, was finished last year, and we all know that there was a shift in priorities, and so far nobody has acted on their proposal. If we want to um, get better at these kind of things, then we really have to work together. And I think a great example of that is the European University Hospital Alliance. Instead of competing between these nine large university centers, they have decided to join forces on this uh, important subject and created the European Center for Cell and Gene Cancer Therapies, or short OICAT. And OICAT has already started to try to coordinate the different clinical trials that are going on and provide access to more patients through this extended network. 
in the end, it comes down to this. If we want to shape the future of modern medicine with European values, and to me that means that we have good, safe, but foremost accessible therapies for our patients, then we really must work together. So I want to end with a picture. Back in the day, I was interested in playing with Lego and also, you might see it, the small um, toy cars. And essentially not much has changed for myself. Obviously I became a physician, but I'm still interested in creating new things and new therapies. This time I'm trying to engineer with the molecular building bricks of life, which is DNA, RNA and protein. And you have heard that the cars that I'm now interested in are much smaller than they used to be. So in the end, I would love to help and contribute, play a small part in a bigger venture where we put all the Lego bricks together to really unlock the full potential of gene editing, not only for cancer therapy, but also for autoimmune diseases, metabolic diseases, and rare genetic diseases. And with this, I would like to thank you all for your attention and hope you have a wonderful rest of the evening.